guys, welcome back to my channel and another Topic Tuesday. So today I'm going to be talking about tips for a nail polish low buy or no buy. And I got to preface this, this is not the real topic for today. The real topic, uh, according to the Instagram, is polishes you're looking forward to wearing this winter, but in this month of content. I've kind of done that like six ways to Sunday. I can't rehash it again. I'll go crazy. You'll go crazy. Like we've done it. However, this is one of the topics that was voted on and it just didn't make the cut, but I like the idea of this topic, especially towards the end of the year as we're getting into the new year. And some people really do like to make changes starting on, you know, January 1st or it just within January. And I feel like a lot of people are going to be trying to or wanting to do a low or no buy. Obviously this isn't exclusive to nail polish. This could be any facet of your life where you want to or need to spend less, but this is a nail polish channel. So we're gonna talk about it as it applies to nail polish. Now, if you don't know what a low buy or a no buy is, I mean, the names are pretty self-explanatory, so you probably know, but they're just general terms for people who are actively trying to spend less on a certain category or just in their life in general. So in this case, a nail polish low buy would be maybe setting specific restrictions for yourself and only spending like the bare minimum on nail polish and a no buy would just be not buying any at all. Now, some people, when they do a no buy, they do allow themselves something like replacements. So, so like, for example, if I was doing a nail polish, no buy, but I was allowing myself replacements, I might not be buying any brand new polishes, any top coats, any base coats, any nail accessories. But if I run out of top coat, I'm allowed to replace it. If I run out of base coat, I'm allowed to replace it. You know, things like that. That can still be incorporated into your no buy. You just have to do it how it works for you. But I do know that it can be difficult to curb your spending. And there are so many reasons that you might want to do a low or a no buy. It's not just financial reasons. Although I do think that is one of the biggest reasons either you just can't afford to because you're overspending or you want to focus that money into another facet of your life. Like maybe you want to save for a vacation or furniture for your home or something and your nail polish budget is just chipping away at money that you could be putting towards other things. Another reason I've been seeing people in the beauty space specifically going on no and low buys is just over accumulation of stuff. Like people are getting overwhelmed by their own purchasing habits, you know, like buying too much that you can't even use the stuff, you can't even appreciate the stuff you have. There are people who, because of the constant consumption, they just forget what they have in their own collections and they end up rebuying the same thing three times over. And that's what they're trying to avoid and accomplish, you know, not doing that anymore when they instate a no buy or a low buy. I have done low buys and no buys in other aspects of my life. Um, specifically makeup and tea. Makeup, I was just like, I have so much of this and so many of these brands lack so much inclusivity and I'm just sick of it, like I'm done. I already have what I need and so I just haven't bought makeup since I quit working for Ulta. I have enough makeup to last me a lifetime. I have enough nail polish to last me a lifetime, but that's different. And then with tea, I, I love tea, I drink a lot of tea, but I was buying tea faster than I could drink it. And so I was like, all right, let's relax. Cause first of all, every time I would buy from David's tea, they would screw it up and they would just mess up my order. And I was getting irritated with them about that. But also, like I said, I have an overabundance of tea. So I kind of set a specific rule where I can't buy more tea until I've completely halved my collection. And I'm not gonna tell you how much tea I have cause it's a lot, but my little sister has more and that's all that matters. <laughs> So I am familiar with low buys and no buys and, and just the things that can really help with that process. And I think that next year with nail polish, I'm going to be doing something similar. You know, I'm going to try and cut back on my nail polish purchasing habits. I might reevaluate some of the stuff I have in my collection. I'm not making any promises on like a D stash or anything. I don't think I'm ready to do something like that. I'm not sure. I do have a video coming out soon this month, just talking about D-stashes in general and like how to purchase from them and all that. But, uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about my personal feelings on D-stashing for myself, but I definitely do want to try and implement some of the things that I'm talking about to you guys today 
in the coming year. So I have eight tips for you today on how to curb your spending or completely eliminate your spending in areas of your life that you just no longer want to put that money into. Now the first one, and this is like the most vital for me and the most important, this is what I end up doing all the time when I'm like, okay, I can't spend any more money on this category, is unsubscribing from any and all marketing emails. When I'm like, I can't be spending right now, I go through my email and every time I get a marketing email, I unsubscribe from it. And that way I'm not getting barraged multiple times a day by ad after ad and sale after sale. It's not good for your psyche. And I feel like it does slowly like wear down on your brain because you go, oh, well, let me just look at this sale. And then you end up spending like $70 at Bath and Body Works, you know? This is gonna be a very tedious step because you're probably subscribed to a ton of marketing emails. But for me, I, um never have emails in my email inbox because I'm a sorter and deleter. And so at this point in my life, it's very easy to unsubscribe from a lot of those, but it might take you a while. Do it in chunks. Just do like unsubscribe from 10 a day until you've got it whittled down and then you won't have to worry about those marketing emails anymore. If you don't know how to unsubscribe from these, don't worry because they make it kind of sneaky. And uh, all you have to do is scroll to the very bottom of whatever email and there should be usually in like the world's tiniest font, a little link that says unsubscribe, and then you'll click that and just follow any steps. If you cannot find this link, because sometimes they make the color of the font like blending into the background of the email, hit control F on your keyboard and type the word unsubscribe. That will find that word on that page for you and then it will drag you right to it. So that way it's quick find, you know? And I'm so serious. When I started doing this, I found myself thinking less about buying things. I found myself tempted far less by things. I just wasn't as compelled to shop. And every so often I have to go through and call because every time you shop with a brand, they do resubscribe you half the time to the email. So you start getting them again. And then, you know, like every a couple of months, I unsubscribe to a bunch of emails and then I go on my way. Tip number two is breathe new life into your current collection. And what I mean by this is just find fun new ways to wear your polish, whether it be like a self-imposed challenge of like, in September, I only wore blues or something like that. For me, that would be something more like incorporating toppers more in ways that I'm not used to or Skittle manicures because I'm not great at Skittle manicures. And there's like so many combinations you can do that can really breathe life into each individual polish. I had so much fun putting together my non-traditional Christmas colors Skittle Manny video, which I'll link in the cards. It made me realize like, there's so many more ways that I can and should be wearing my polishes and like mixing finishes and textures and colors is accessible to me. And I just was holding myself back because I was self-conscious about doing it wrong, you know? And utilizing toppers too over not just creams because that's all I ever do is I use a topper over cream and that's it. But putting them over different finishes as well, that's another way that I can be breathing new life and adding new depth to my own current collection without buying more new stuff. And I'll go way more in depth on the topper thing in my final video of 2022, because I have some plans for toppers in 2023. Tip number three is something that I only started doing in September of this year, but I have found that it has really redirected my focus. And that is making a monthly nail polish rack. It really helped me focus on polishes that I really love in my collection, but I don't reach for as often for one reason or another. You can do a rack however you want, maybe based on the season. What I've been doing is choosing themes. So in September, I, like I said earlier, did a all blue nail polish rack because I'm born in September. I am born in September. I was born in September and my birthstone is sapphire. And so I was like, let me wear all blues, all sapphire blues for the month of September. And then I had so much fun with it that in October, I was like, I'm only gonna wear spooky themed polishes. And then in November, I was like, well, let's do neutral November and start getting some use out of neutrals that I just haven't shown love in a really long time. And then of course for December, I'm doing holiday Christmassy type polishes. And I have a ton of ideas for next year's themes. Get ready for January because it's gonna be Revenge of the Reds. What this does, aside from choosing the theme and stuff like that, is I sit down and I grab my swatch sticks and I just try and pick 
around 30 or so because for me that's what like the size of the collection I want to be able to choose from throughout the month is and then I just go through my swatch sticks and I see how does this fit with this month's theme does it fit does it not and as I'm doing that I'm really like I'm physically holding all the swatch sticks and looking at all the colors and being able to kind of see what I have because as much as I love Helmers they are so nice because they are compact for storage you can't see what you have which is why I have the swatch sticks but if I'm not actively going through my swatch sticks then I'm still not seeing what I have so it's nice to have I don't know swatch stick time you know and make that seasonal rack or that monthly rack tip number four is kind of more of a project than anything but it is to go through and sort and reorganize your collection I for me personally find that this is one of the best ways to reconnect with the stuff that I have. A lot of times you remember what's fun and new, but you don't remember the old classics or like the old favorites until you've actually touched them. You know, you've actually seen them. And also when I'm feeling a little bit uninspired in a certain hobby, whether that's makeup, tea, my cross stitch, my stationery, because I have a lot of hobbies, a good thorough reorganization of the supplies for that hobby is always enough to reinvigorate me and like get me excited and inspired again. And I fully admit I may be biased because I absolutely love organizing things. It's sorting things. I, it's, it's like a passion of mine. It's like soothing for me. I love like the tactile sensation of like touching everything I own, like all my nail polishes, the visual stimulation from all the colors laid out in front of me, the mental work that it takes to figure out how am I going to arrange these this time? How am I going to put them in order? Am I going to do dark to light, light to dark? Am I going to do alphabetical by brand, alphabetical by name? It just kind of takes your whole body focus to do something like this, at least when your collection is like my size. <laughs> and I just love seeing all the colors and shapes and designs of all the bottles strewn across my floor. <laughs> so for me, that's enough to really reinvigorate my feelings in my collection and maybe find some new gems that I forgot I had. But also if you're too busy sorting all your polishes, you won't have time to be browsing to buy more. Tip number five actually comes from a YouTuber that I watch called Hannah Louise Poston and she's like more makeup and fashion but she does something that she calls duping the vibes and in her case whenever she's really wanting this new makeup palette she sits down with a photo of it and she goes into her own collection and tries to dupe the vibes of that makeup palette and you've seen me do this in a few of my reviews as well where I'm trying to dupe out the collection but I already bought the collection in that case which kind of defeats the purpose. So in the future, if there's collections where I'm just kind of like on the fence about, I think it would be best if I sat down with my own collection and tried to dupe out the vibes of that collection coming out because trends are very cyclical. And so sometimes stuff that's getting released is stuff that was popular five, 10 years ago. And you might just already have those things in your collection. Maybe they aren't the exact same. Maybe the tone or hue of the color is like a smidgen off. But is it really enough that you need that new one or not? You know, you have to decide that for yourself. I think this is easier to do with mainstream collections than it is for indies for someone like me because I don't have as many indies. Well, I have a lot of indies now, but like at the beginning of my nail polish collecting, I only was buying mainstream. So I have more mainstreams than indies. But it is fun. It's again, you get to sit down, you pull all your swatch sticks out and it's like a scavenger hunt within your own collection. And I think that Sometimes when you do do about the vibes and you actually have it in your hands, you realize I didn't really want this item to begin with. What I really wanted was the feeling of buying something. I really wanted the feeling of waiting on a product to come to me, a package, waiting for that to get into my hands and like the excitement of having something new. But the item itself isn't what was important to me. And that is like a really important thing to acknowledge when you are buying stuff. Am I buying this because I want it? Or am I buying it because I like to buy things? <laughs> Which I am one of those types of people. I do like to buy things. So sometimes duping the vibes of a collection that you want can kind of help you decide if that's what you're doing or not. Number six is one that I like to do often when I get enticed by a sale or I get excited about some kind of big blowout on a website. And that is build a cart 
and walk away. Whenever I get sale notifications that I just can't like resist and I click through and I start loading up my cart, you go, oh, it's on sale, so it's cheaper, so it's fine. But then you end up spending way more than you ever would have when there wasn't a sale. And this isn't necessarily a problem in and of itself, but sometimes you end up buying things that you wouldn't have bought otherwise, things that are just really not necessary, things that are redundant to your collection. And so what I like to do, because the way I like to online shop is I like to add everything I want into a cart and then kind of call the cart later and decide, like the official cart, is I will sit there and I'll go through the site and I will put everything that I want in that cart and then I will stand up and I will get my phone and I will get my headphones and I will literally just go and walk away. I will go for a walk for like an hour, put a podcast on, really loud so that I can hear it. And then I go for my walk and I play my little Pikmin Bloom phone game that I love so much. And by the time I come back to my home, I forgot that I was going on a walk for that reason. And then I start doing other stuff. I make dinner, I pick up. And then by the time I'm like, oh, I need to use my computer for something. And I boot it back up and that cart pops back up. I go, oh yeah, I don't want any of this. And I exit out of it and I walk away again because I just didn't, I, it was, I was caught up in the moment. And if it was something that I truly was like gunning to get back home for, because I'm like, I really do want this. I, for me personally, I know that that means I did really want it. There's a lot of stuff that I think, oh, I want this so bad. And then literally 40 minutes later, I'm like, wait, what was that? Because I just got too impassioned about it. But then there's other things where I do think about it every day all the time. And that's how I know that's how I can differentiate the difference between a true want and like just a whim thing. So this next tip is only for my low buy people, not people who are doing a full no buy because this won't affect you at all. And that is to set a budget or a cap on the number of polishes. And you can do this in a variety of ways, but setting your own cap or threshold, as long as you're the type of person who can follow that, I think that this is really helpful. Me, the type of personality that I have, as soon as a rule is put in place, as soon as, like, even if it's self-imposed, I get this, like, fear of breaking the rule because I'm just like, oh my God, no, I can't. They're gonna send me to the principal's office. If I break this rule, I gotta be careful. When I was a child, I followed a lot of rules. I was a pretty good rule follower, right up until, like, eighth grade, and then it was all downhill. But there's a few ways you can do this. You can set a month-to-month -month budget or cap. You can set a budget or cap for the whole year. I find it's more manageable to say like, this is how much I want to spend or buy for the whole year and then divide that out amongst the months. And then you can roll stuff over if you need to or not your choice. I just think that if I said like, oh, I can spend this much money for the whole year, it would be really hard to manage over the course of those 12 months. So I like to have a kind of a month to month breakdown and kind of branching off from that. If you do set a cap, I believe it's Nail Polish Hound who does this where Whenever she brings something new into her collection, she ends up decluttering an equivalent item or like a certain number of equivalent items that helps to keep her collection manageable. So if you're doing this for like a collection management side of things rather than a financial side of things, that might be another thing you could consider because I thought that was really interesting. You know, you bring one in, you declutter two or something like that. And you know, your budget is something that is completely personal to you. It really depends on you know how high or low of a cost of living area you live in, your current salary, how much you actually want to save or like put towards nail polish. I can't tell you what's right for you. You kind of have to look at your own budget and decide that. But I personally like the idea of allocating only a certain dollar amount to like my nail polish hobby in the coming year because I'm finding more and more. I I finally found this place that I, I enjoy living. I like the way it looks. I like the area we're in and I actually want to buy home decor. I never used to buy decor for my homes. I don't have anything on the walls before this apartment. We just never did that because we moved so frequently, but I like this place and I find that I want to decorate it more. I'm getting heavy into like plants and this spring I'd like to put more focus on that sort of a thing. And you know, this year my nails kind of took the whole hog of my fun money. So I just want to change that for next year. And the final tip and the tip that I am the worst follower of is to check your swatches before you buy something. And like, this is me yelling at myself because I don't do this. It's like half the point of the swatch sticks, you know? And I just, I just make them because I like them at this point. I think from now on, before I place an order, I just have to 
pull out my swatch sticks and take the time to look through them and make sure I really just don't have anything overlapping because at this point, I just should not be buying so many similar polishes. I can't get through one bottle of anything, let alone five. So it's pretty pointless to buy like three or four polishes from different brands that look similar. It doesn't make any sense. If you have a bigger collection, but you don't have a very straightforward and easy way to determine what you have in that collection, aside from, you know, pulling out individual bottles and, you know, looking at them, I highly recommend some sort of swatching system. I personally use swatch sticks. I put them on rings. I like to hang them on my wall for like aesthetic purposes, but that's not really necessary. But it's really nice to have these and they're like smaller, they're a little bit compact. So, you know, I can look at this and very easily, you know, put two together and compare, obviously these are not the same, but they're just right next to me and compare them and see what I have and how they look next to each other. I put the names and the brands on it so it's easy for tracking, but there are so many other ways you could do it. You could literally paint them into a book. You could, they have these like swatch books that you can buy on Amazon. Like there's so many different ways to catalog your collection in this way. And I think it does help quite a lot. Not only for figuring out if you're about to buy a dupe, but I really love being able to pull out a swatch stick and see what it looks like on a nail because sometimes what a polish looks like in the bottle isn't necessarily indicative of how it's going to be swatched out, especially when you have like huge flaky bombs. Sometimes those flakies are so dense in a bottle that you don't really know how they're going to spread across the nail, but with the swatch stick, you do. I can also grab several and kind of compare them together and see like, oh, would this make a cute Skittle manicure? Oh, are these similar? Oh, like what's going on with these? I just think that it is for me an indisposable tool. I believe I did a video on like how I organize my collection. So I will post that up top. And I always, always, always in the description box have links to the swatch sticks and the label maker that I personally use to make all my swatch sticks. So yeah, those are my eight best tips for those of you who are looking to go on a no buy or a low buy. For me personally, one of the biggest things that I don't do is I don't call it a low buy or a no buy. I just say like, because psychologically, the second you tell me, no, you can't do this. I'm like, I want to do it. So <laughs> I'm just like, let me just cut back a little bit. Let me just chill out in this department. I never say no to myself because as soon as I do, the toddler in me is like, you can't tell me no. So I just don't even call it a no buy or a low buy when I'm doing it. I just am like, we're taking a step back. But those are the tips that I found really do work for me. And if you guys have any other tips to share with us, let us know in the comments down below. I really love when you guys share your own experiences because I feel like a lot of us get, you know, help from each other in this realm. And like that moral support is always really nice. And if you are planning on doing a low buy or a no buy next year, let me know down below as well. I'd love to hear you know, what you're doing in order to keep yourself on track. But that's going to be it for me. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.